Okay, so now I'd like to officially welcome everyone to our seventh installment in the Journey for Life webinar series. So in this one in particular, I'm really excited because we're going to be building on the discussions we had last week and thinking about other resistances and the other resistance movements that Zapatismo has traveled alongside of and has been in com conversation with among the many years. So for this event, I'm really excited. We, we have some amazing speakers. We have Paul Chatterton and Tash Gordon, um, who will begin our, begin our discussion. Paul Chatterton is a writer, researcher, and campaigner. In 2000, he spent two years living in the civilian communities of the EZLN, building gravity flow water systems. He is now professor of urban futures at the School of Geology and director of the University Sustainable Cities Group, which has launched the groundbreaking MSC Sustainable Cities. Paul is co-founder and resident of the award-winning Low Impact Housing Cooperative, LILAC. His recent books include Low Impact Living and Unlocking Sustainable Cities with Pluto Press. He is the co-founder of the public charity Antipod, dedicated to research and scholarship in radical geography. And then briefly joining Paul will be Tash Gordon, Tash is a healthcare worker who spent two years in Chiapas supporting the Zapatista Autonomous Health Clinics. So without further ado, um, Paul and Tash, I, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anthony. And uh, I'm going to be tag teaming it with Tash. So I'll make a few uh, introductory statements and then I'll, 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 I'll leave the room, grab Tash, and then she'll come back because we've got uh, as, as you, um, yeah, some, some um, noisy, wonderful children in the background. So, um, so Rewind 20 years, um, Tash and I um, spent uh, two years in Chiapas uh, and then some time in, in, in just afterwards in, in Argentina, um, just after the Corralito when, when, the, when the, uh, the, the peso collapsed in Argentina. Um, we, 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 uh, we headed over to Chiapas in 2000 um, because we were involved in a solidarity group uh, called Kiptik, um, which means strength in the local uh, language Zeltal. Um, in, in, in one of the, my languages. Um, from about 1998, we, we became fascinated and intrigued with the Zapatista struggle. Um, uh, and we were based in Newcastle and we held a number of solidarity events uh, to raise money um, for, for, for um, autonomous projects in, 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 the, in Chiapas. We'd started to hear that they were building an alternative world yeah, we were so excited about reading the communiques of Subcomandante Marcos and, and hearing this um, online international revolution which was happening um, against neoliberalization and for hope um, in, 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 in Chiapas. And we were, we were just like massively excited. So look, in our enthusiasm, we just started holding parties and doing stalls and all sorts of things, selling coffee, which got imported by an amazing German collective of, um, of Mexican uh, uh, Chiapas, Chiapan coffee. And we started to raise money for, for a number of projects, autonomous health projects and um, autonomous water projects. And we were really taken mainly by this idea of autonomy, yeah? that they were building this autonomous infrastructure, mainly because as they saw it, the bad government had retreated from providing the basics of life and, and had done so for, for 500 years under conditions of colonialism, right? To mine population, right, in, 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 in Southern Chiapas. Um, so we started just sending that money out via a, a solidarity group, yeah? And um, and then one of my mates got, um, got, a, got a job out there working for a US, um, a solidarity group who who started to build uh, water systems and then he said to me and said look do you want to come out and volunteer so in 2000 we both took the opportunity we just like we said look we've got to do this this is just an amazing opportunity we left our jobs and we went out there um so i my, my partner tasha you hear from she she's she's a works in in the medical world so she had more direct skills than me so i i was a uh, um, yeah, geographer. So I, I just went out there and let my support. So we, we started to basically build, map, support and build gravity flow water systems. So Chappers is very hilly, as many of you might know. So we were based in the Lacandon, uh, Lacandon jungle, which is like the, the southern bit of Chappers near the Guatemalan border. We're in the um, autonomous zone of Morelia. Like the Zapatista world is, is, is uh, divided up into different autonomous districts. So we were in Morelia and there was a particular caracol um, which is the kind of center of that autonomous zone where we were based. And then from there, we would meet the delegates 
um, from the different uh, Zapatista communities. Um, and what we would do is they would tell us their needs, their, where they wanted a particular water system. And we would turn up in their village and do some basic kind of mapping and surveying, which was absolutely new to me as well. Um, and we would find that they would show us their local spring. We would build um, um, a pipe system and a gravitation water tank in their village. And we would spend two or three weeks with them building all this. So it was an absolutely amazing experience, right, to... Um, be led by the community in terms of what they needed to basically go and get a whole bunch of cement and pipes and work with them to develop the water system that they had identified and wanted. Yeah, and at the same time, you hear from Tashi was doing autonomous health work, setting up health clinics. And one of the most amazing reflections from me is the the detail of everyday life. You know, spending a few weeks in different villages, talking to people, trying to understand. You know, the, obviously the communication was very basic. My my Spanish was getting better. But, and, and obviously I was desperately trying to learn different bits of my language, but there were so many different ones. So you go to one village, village that spoke um, Zotzil and another Zoldal, so they were different anyway. So, so actually Spanish became the glue between them. Um, and at the same time, there was lots of other people doing international solidarity work, lots of Italians, Spanish, Catalans, and lots of, lots of other people um, from, from the north of Mexico. So it was a real international hotbed. Yeah. Um, and one of the most interesting things for me were the complexities of village life. I and mean, some of these were tiny villages in the middle of uh, clearings. Um, so, and, and, and to spend time trying to understand whether um, who affiliated with the Zapatista movement, who didn't affiliate with the Zapatista movement, what that um, what that actually meant to them in real life and just spending time with them. Um, on an evening talking about what they what their struggle was, what it meant to them, and more importantly, what they wanted from us. And one of the most interesting conversations, which I'll really end with, because this is the main point I wanted to get across. Um, I won that, I was having this amazing conversation with this guy, guy Manuel in one of the villages, and he was like, so how many Zapatistas are there in your village where you live? I mean, because obviously, you know, it's a complex, big world, isn't it? And I was like, I don't think there's any Zapatistas where we live. And he's like, that's, and he was like, that's really interesting. Um, how are you going to... How are you going to make more Zapatistas where you live then? Because like, what that's what we're trying to do. We go to the next village and we try to like encourage them to join the Zapatista movement. So like, how do you? How are you going to do that in in your in when you where you come from? And that, that was the most that was the most amazing question that they that, that I was asked in the whole two years. And what it led me to think about was, um, how do you be a Zapatista wherever you are? Yeah. And I wrote a chapter about this in a book. That's the only thing I've ever written about the Zapatistas because I didn't want to write about them. I just wanted to kind of, kind of, you know, hold that kind of relationship with them. Um, so when I came home in 2002 with Tash, we started furiously trying to like organize autonomous infrastructure and set up autonomous social centers and think about how, do, how can we be Zapatistas in Leeds? Yeah. Like here we are back in the West, you know, back, back in the majority world. How can we like take that spirit of Zapatismo and like start to build autonomous infrastructure, which challenges neoliberalism. And it was a it was a mind blowing experience for us because, you know, that was really where the struggle is, you know, because essentially they said to us, go home. Thanks for your water pipes. Yeah. Like, thanks for being here. It's cool to see you. Thanks for your money. But go, the best thing you can all do for us is go home and be a Zapatista. And I was like fantastic brilliant so i mean that was 2002 that was 20 years ago i'm not sure if i'm now a more uh, i've become a zapatista i feel i am and I, I certainly felt that what 20 years ago maybe i'm a slightly older zapatista but like what i want to discuss for the rest of the evening with you what does that mean to be a zapatista wherever we are to resist neoliberalization to identify what we're up against those big projects yeah those big multinational projects international transnational projects that we have to resist be it in the european union or be it in the uk how do we build education resources and infrastructure to challenge that um and that's what keeps me going actually as an academic, as an activist, as a citizen in the world. Um, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to hopefully go get Tash and hope she, hopefully she can replace me really quickly. Hello. <laughs> um, so I've just been uh, rescued from childcare activities and told that I can come in here and talk about healthcare in the Zapatista communities. Um, so my name's Tash and quite a while ago now, just trying to think, 10, 15 years ago, um, I spent uh, one and a half, two years working 
um, supporting the Zapatista health communities, um, which was an amazing experience. Um, really to see um, people who had, you know, reclaimed their health and their health system and what well, they they'd recognized that the health system that existed in Mexico was not an appropriate healthcare system for them as indigenous people. It wasn't in their language, it didn't recognize their culture, and it wasn't grassroots. And they were really clear with me from the start that I was not there to run their system, I was not there to tell them what to do. I was there to understand what they were doing and come up with ways that I could support them. And some of my suggestions they took on board and others they didn't, which was completely appropriate. Um, and it was just really inspiring um, from each community, at least one and often more, depending on the size of the community, um, person becomes a healthcare promoter and they're trained um, in, you know, just basic healthcare, try how to promote public health, whether that's teaching people um, how to ensure that their drinking water is safe or managing minor illnesses or recognizing when um, when you need to seek more urgent medical care. Um, and they are part of their community. They they train and then they're, you know, they're living in a community that they understand that they're part of, that they've grown up in um, and they continue to live and be active in other parts of the community. And they, they're, they're there to provide basic health care to their community. Um, my involvement when I was there was helping to train them um, in ways that they wanted to be trained. And um, I also supported the development of a second level clinic where some of the more experienced healthcare promoters um, were able to deal with more serious health conditions. And we were able to um, hospitalize patients if needed and set up a lab in one of those um, second level clinics as well to diagnose, you know, things like parasitic conditions and do simple blood tests. Um, but it was just amazing to be in a, you know, one story that's always struck with me is in a very, very small community, no running water, they had taken over what used to be, um, you know, the landlord of that whole area's house. And part of that house was now providing the school, part of it was the health, healthcare centre. And, you know, they, they had really taken back power and control over their life in the way and 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 they had been the determinants of how that should work um yeah and it was also really great to see that the healthcare promoters were of a mix of age and genders um and that was quite well supported i mean unfortunately i think some of the female healthcare promoters once they got married and had kids were less likely to continue um, but yeah, it was a really inspiring experience. And I think as often is the case, I probably learned more from them about self-organizing and how you can really transform your life than I possibly helped them to learn about healthcare. I don't know if anybody in my short gap, if anybody wants to ask me anything about healthcare systems in Chappas. You know what we can do? Um... For most of these webinars, we've been holding off some of the Q&A until the very end. Okay. I know that you and Paul have to leave early today. So perhaps we, we can carve out a few minutes if anyone does have any questions for, for, for you. If anyone does have a question, because um, we're not recording the, the discussion, so, so we can edit this part out. So, so you don't have to worry about being on camera if you feel weird about that. I can see that well, let, well, let me ask. If I could ask, how did they understand health as about everyday life, perhaps more than about you know, health care delivery, as in many Western countries? Um, well, I guess they, yeah, yeah, their, their definition of it was not the definition. Well, I, you know, the World Health Organization definition of health is actually really broad, and it was much more in keeping with that than you know, a hospital based approach, it was around, um, you know, how, yeah, how to how to make your life as as healthy as possible with and lots of the work that the healthcare promoters did was around, you know, encouraging people not to cook inside their small huts, because of the smoke and the, you know, long term impact of that or around kind of public health. It was interesting. It was quite difficult to talk about mental health, that that 
that was very difficult to raise and was almost never raised as mental health. It was raised as headaches or stomach pain. So that that really did stand out as something very different from my experience of working in the UK. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question. That definitely kind of resonates um, with me having worked in the in mental health in the UK, you know, the kind of stigma around speaking about it, you know, e even here in London. Yeah. Um, we do have a question in the chat from Veronica um, Cordova, Cord ah, Cordova, sorry about that. She's kind of, Veronica, actually, do, do you want to speak to this yourself or would you prefer me to read it out? I can go ahead and read it. Basically, she's asking about how it was that they asked you to not um, teach them, but to kind of learn with them. You know, you know how, how did that conversation take place? Uh, it, that was very explicit. It was like first time that I was introduced to them, that they that some of the more senior um, people from the health committee sat me down and said, you are not here to tell us what to do. And we don't want you as a doctor, you know, we recognize that you might have worked as a doctor somewhere else and have different skills and have worked in different ways, but we don't want, we, this is our healthcare system and you're here as a volunteer and, you know, you need to understand how we're working and, you know, you need to think carefully about how you can contribute to that and you can put ideas to us and we will consider them but they will need to be in keeping with you know with the the philosophy of the EZLN and with how our base communities work um and it you know sometimes sometimes to be honest it was really frustrating sometimes and and there was some interesting stuff around it sometimes it was really appropriate um and sometimes it felt like because i was a younger female um person that and I wasn't and it wasn't my community that yeah that often my ideas were disregarded some things were had to be disregarded from me and then had to be reintroduced from them and and maybe that's you know that maybe that's just frustrating for me but completely appropriate yeah excuse me but there weren't any white members uh, everybody I was working with were indigenous um people from the local community just quickly before we lose tash i just wanted to ask um about what you said about um women and them being less likely to continue with that um, healthcare promoter work when they get married i think that's really interesting because i know that in the early i mean 20 years ago i was five full disclosure so i'm very new to a lot of this but i'm aware that like like major Susanna in the very early like in the 90s was talking about how women in Chiapas want also the right to like drive a truck or study and they want these rights even from men in their own community so I guess what I'm asking is how is it because these women are doing unpaid labor in the household that they're unlikely to continue with that community work and if so why is it that in these autonomous zones where we're where they're actively resisting neoliberalism as a social structure that women are still doing that unpaid labor do you see what i mean yeah i mean obviously my experience is now 15 years out of date and it might have changed significantly but all the unpaid labor in the house was done by the women all the cooking all the cleaning all the child care and women you know there were lots of women who made decisions not to have a family and to retain the autonomy that they were that they are you know they're, they're very well supported to have if they don't have families but there wasn't any mechanism in the certainly in the communities that i worked in for women to continue in their you know some some of the women with families were doing things like wanting women's cooperatives but they were not you know all the high up women in the health zone that I worked with were uh, women who had had chosen between the two things it was it was a, it didn't I didn't see any examples of where women had been able to have both and to be honest as a working mum in the UK is a bit of a lie that you can completely have both anyway even with a supportive partner um but right, right for sure there's no there's no both unless there is 
you know, socialized childcare, right? There's no way in which you can pick up your child and write the paper and give the treatment unless there's some form of social catch-all that does that domestic labor for women, right? Yeah. And that certainly um, was not there when I was there. So, sorry, Veronica, Karina, I'm going to respectfully disagree, disagree with you because uh, Major Susanna for, uh, in 1993 said, and this is before 94, she said, we don't, we Zapatista women do not wish to be obliged to marry someone we don't love. We want to have only the children we want and can care for. We want the right to a position in the community. We want the right to say what we think and have it be respected. We want the right to study and even to be truck drivers. So I, I appreciate that like what you, you feel that I'm coming from like a white feminist perspective. I'm not white, neither is my feminism and neither are the, the you know, and neither is the statement that I just read from 93. So I'm gonna respectfully disagree. Okay, if, if I can maybe jump in as chair here. Um, I, I know that we've had a really interesting discussion in the chat as well. And, and Claudio has also reminded us that, that this, that, that the situation has changed a bit in the last 15 years. But maybe just to keep things moving along so we can still have time at the end for discussion, um, we can move on to Kiki now. So Kiki Kivish is a popular educator, writer, and translator who accompanies the Zapatista, Palestinian, and Black liberation struggles. You can learn more about her work at a ridiculously nice looking website that puts the rest of us academics to shame. Um, and I'll share her website in the chat. So Kiki, um, I can turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thanks for everyone, everyone's uh, participation, everyone being here. Thank you for inviting me. I hope I can offer something that you might find helpful and in our conversations as well can help me. I was asked to uh, present my experience in accompanying the Zapatista movement and the Palestine movement together. And so what I'll do is for um, 20 minutes, I'll try to keep it in 20, I'll kind of give a little bit of autobiographical take on how that happened because it's very strange uh, to a lot of people and even people in Palestine, it's very strange to see someone from Latin America there. Uh, and, and then um, I'll talk about what I understand, what I, what I understood from both movements in terms of similarities and, and differences and possibilities. So I, uh, I, I'm also a geographer, uh, like our, my co-panelist, Paul. I was uh, studying, I'm from California, from Guatemala. My family was all undocumented migrants from Guatemala into California in the 70s. I was born, I you know, tried to be a really good student, citizen, the only one in my whole family that has papers or that had papers at the time and just wanted to be a very well-behaved kind of person. Uh, knowing that the eyes of immigration, police, the government were always on us. And so really tried not to make any waves. In 1994, I was 15 and I was doing high school things, trying to figure out, you know, adolescence. And I didn't know anything about the Zapatistas until 2003, almost 10 years later, when I enrolled by there's a whole other story um, in a geography program simply because I wanted to know why Los Angeles was laid out the way that it was. And I took an urban geography class. It was fascinating. It blew my mind. I didn't know you could major in such a thing. And so then I enrolled in a master's program. And that was the first time that I had even heard of uh, Marxism spoken out loud. My undergraduate was in business and IT, because I wanted to get a job in the 90s and the internet was becoming mainstream. And so across, it was the same school. So across campus in my grad seminars, we were talking about Hart and Negri's empire and Marx. And I was like, is this legal? <laughs> because I grew up in the Cold War and in, in the United States. And it was so fascinating to me because it allowed me in this little tiny corner of geography, which was, it's understood as radical geography, Marxist, feminist, anarchist. It allowed me to really ask questions that I wasn't allowed to ask before. And I ended up doing my master's thesis on transnational migra migrants from Guatemala and the United States. And then I moved on to a PhD because I liked geography so much. And I wanted to study the Mexico-Guatemala border because it's looking a lot like the US, 
Mexico border, and that was back in 2003. And I was uh, at the same time also confused, I think like most people in the United States about Israel-Palestine. I knew about Israel because when I was nine, I saw the diary of Anne Frank. I was traumatized. I was happy Israel existed, happy the United States supported it. I had no idea how Israel was created until about 10 years later. And I was so heartbroken. I felt lied to. I couldn't stop thinking about Palestine. And that was all through self-study. I didn't know any Palestinians, any Muslims, any Arabs, any Jews. I'm not from that hemisphere. I'm native Mayan, Mesoamerican from this hemisphere. And so at the, so it was very strange to me how I couldn't stop thinking about Palestine, doing the self-study, didn't know who to believe anymore. And I ended up uh, finding a guidebook uh, that said, hey, you know, uh, it was a lonely planet because I wanted to visit the Middle East. It was 2005. The U.S. had just gone to war with Iraq, and I already knew by that time that the media, the mainstream media, was lying. And uh, I decided to backpack on a winter break to the Middle East by myself, mainly because I saw there was a Lonely Planet guy that said a little paragraph in the back, solo women travelers. I'm like, oh, women can travel, have traveled solo to the Middle East. Sign me up. I'll do that. And I went not knowing anybody, and I just went and went to Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, Israel, Palestine. And I kept an open mind about everything. Uh, I was racially profiled at, in the at Ben Gurion airport in Israel. That really didn't help the case for Zionism uh, as I was trying to question everything. And six months later, the Lebanon Israel war hit. I was in Chiapas in that summer. I was supposed to be doing my undergraduate, uh, I'm sorry, my pre-dissertation research on the Mexico-Guatemala border, but I couldn't stop thinking about Palestine during this whole situation, six months after my visit to the area, to Lebanon and Syria. And I, uh, long story short, I went back to the university. I kept talking to my advisor about Palestine instead of Guatemala and Mexico. And she's like, you've got to change your dissertation topic or you're not going to graduate. And um, I did. <laughs> and my entire dissertation was on Palestine's borders. And uh, uh, so, and I went there and I lived there for a year and I really kind of just hacked my dissertation. And I had, uh, I, I was so lucky to have an advisor who was so supportive about what I wanted to learn and not about replicating her work like a lot of academic advisors do or replicating her, reproducing her. And I really just went and hacked my dissertation time, resources, so that I could learn about the Palestinian struggle. I was stunned at how it was still going on for so long, like how they held it down. I had a, um, a radical consciousness um, by that time in terms of the migrant struggle in the US, black struggle in the US, the native struggle in the US. And so uh, I, with, with the Palestinian struggle years later, I can say that the reason why it was so moving for me was because it was the first time I ever saw anybody say no to something that they didn't like or that they didn't want. And I didn't, I, 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 I had been raised to not make any waves, to just accept things the way that they were. And so Palestine was the first time that I was able to understand what dignity was. And now I see it in so many other places, but I see it in black struggle, I see it in native struggle, but I didn't see it before. So I'm very grateful for the Palestine uh, movement, people struggle for that, and um, really forcing me to ask a lot of questions that had been very, very uncomfortable to me. And at the same time, while I was doing Palestine work, I started to learn more about the Zapatistas and not just about how they're a movement against neoliberalism that rose up in 1994, but I started to learn about their political theory and their political philosophy, their worldview, like at that level, which I, 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 I realized uh, shortly after and even then that there aren't a lot of places that, that talk about the Zapatistas at that level, like at the level of, of, of world shifting. Uh, of metaphysics. And that was really important to me, especially because in the PhD program in geography, I was learning a lot of political theory and it didn't make any sense. I think some of my professors probably didn't really know that much either. 
and just we just all were not admitting it. Nobody in the seminar was admitting it. But when I started to read the Zapatista communiques and listen to people who were putting the movement in conversation with uh, political philosophy, political theory, radical struggle, then so many things in life clicked. So then very quickly, and I'm very happy to um, to talk more about this in detail in Q&A, some things that I realized right away were very similar about Palestine and the Zapatista movement is that they're an anti-colonial struggle and they both under they've both undergone a peace process famously and uh, the Palestinian movement um, has been stuck in it and the Zapatistas were able to unstick themselves through a lot of creativity and a lot of risk and a lot of experimentation. Uh, something that um, is also very, very uh, is similar to both of them is that it's a land question. And I've known that from the beginning, I just didn't understand how deep that was until I started to learn from Palestinian farmers and learn from the Zapatistas, different ways of being with the land. I grew up in California where there's industrial agriculture. That's my community, Oxnard, California. I didn't want anything to do with land, with agriculture, with soil, because I, I thought that that was it. But in Palestine and the Zapati and, and Chiapas, Zapatista territory, I learned about different ways of being with the land and then how necessary it is to have access to land for that, because that's the condition of possibility for the creation of new worlds. It's not just like a moral thing about that's our land, you took it, now give it back. It's way deeper than that. And I learned that in particular in um, Zapatista territory and the, during the little school where they invited thousands of people from all over the world to come and live with a Zapatista community for a few days. That was in 2013. <clears throat> Some, uh, I will say too, I was also, while I was in Palestine, I did um, a seminar in a refugee camp one summer where we read the Sixth Declaration of the Lacandon Jungle, talked about the Zapatistas. I was very surprised in Palestine that a lot of people didn't know who the Zapatistas were, but I had already been surprised in Palestine that when I got there, which was the mid 2000s, there was almost no left left. And that history is 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 very uh, very much shared with the rest of the Middle East. It was the left there was very tied to the Soviet Union. So when the Soviet Union falls and there's no left, whereas in Latin America that was certainly the case with Cuba. Although Cuba was able to continue even after the Soviet Union left, but in so much of Latin America there was a very uh, contentious relationship with the Soviet Union in that that for many movements they felt that the Soviet Union was trying to impose one world on everybody. It's either the first world or the second world, and you got to, it is going to be imposed one way on everybody. And for the Zapatistas, uh, it seems that when the Soviet Union fell, like for them and for many other movements that were trying to do uh, a left in a different way, it was a, a, a sigh of relief in many ways that the Soviet Union wasn't going to have a monopoly over what an anti-capitalist politics was. So <clears throat> something that, um, that I've tried to do in the last several years is try to build these connections between Chiapas and Palestine. And it's not because the Zapatistas need it at all. They very famously make pronouncements in support of Gaza and Palestine all of the time. This is the thing that the Palestinian movement um, doesn't really know that much or hasn't in the past. And so I, I took a delegation to Chiapas to attend the little school. Um, and also I've been trying for several years to have some friends to tr translate the Sixth Declaration into Arabic because there's very little Arabic translations on the Zapatista website. And that was really, it was really exciting in March to see the Sixth Declaration translated into Arabic and several other uh, pieces. And what was even more exciting about that is I asked around all my friends and nobody knows who did it. So I'm so excited that it's a lot bigger than us, <laughs> those of us that I know. So. There, there's movement around, which is really exciting. And I think that in the last few years, what I've seen, which is different from when I first started accompanying the Palestinian struggle, when I first started accompanying the Palestinian struggle, it was in the very post-Oslo phase where the Palestinian movement had been taught that it needed to focus on its 
it creating a state and, and or liberating Palestine, no matter where those borders were. But it wasn't anymore an internationalist or globalist struggle like it had been in the 60s and 70s. And they had been very, um, very isolated, even from their own neighbors, from Egypt, very famously with the Camp David Treaty, and then uh, uh, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, like so many of these regimes really couldn't stand the Palestinian movement in the concrete, in the abstract, they would always give a lot of, you know, lip service to it for their own people. And so something that was really um, interesting to see, has been interesting to see, is that what has gone from a, a position from a lot of the Palestinian movement in terms of everybody got their state, we're the only ones who didn't get our state, which is obviously not true. I mean, next door there's Kurdistan, but also so many native peoples don't have a state that's for them. They're under other states. And um, it was a very much exceptionalist kind of movement, at least from the leadership, that this is the worst struggle, the, the, the worst situation in the, war, in, the history, in the world. Everyone needs to pay attention to it. And then not really being able to connect their struggles with others. And that was the situation I found myself in when I first started. And now what I'm seeing is that there's a lot more openness. And at the same time, in Palestine, the situation right now, and I'll wrap up with this so we can um, move on to our, our next speaker. Uh, in Palestine, the situation right now, and it has been for quite a while, is that the leadership, the Palestinian leadership, uh, is in massive tension with so many Palestinians, whether they're refugees or whether they're in Gaza uh, or in, in the West Bank or in uh, what is now Israel, 1948 uh, Palestine is what it's called, 48 Palestine. And so um, what many people on the ground have been saying for at least the last decade is that the next Intifada, the third Intifada, the, the third uprising of the Palestinian people is going to have to be against their own leadership. And so then this this is an opening to start thinking more about movements in terms of like how Palestine, it's about all Palestinians, or as a Zapatista movement is an organization with a membership structure and accountability. And I and and so you know we can be Zapatista in heart or through ideology, but to be an actual Zapatista, it's not that they don't allow just any Mexican in just because they're in Mexico. Like the, the ideology is, is, is really central and is accountability and, and work. So it's very different from a political party in that way. It's very different from a nationalist movement like the Palestinian movement. It's very different from saying like the black liberation struggle, which can, uh, for sure there are many, very shared oppressions, but in terms of, so then what to do that there's so many different ideas and that's the case with Palestine. Whereas with an organization like the Zapatistas, and I think a lot, all of us can learn, a lot of us can learn about that as maybe a question that we might want to have, like the, the, the building of a collective, of an organization with accountability, with um, shared ideology in order to move forward uh, rather than, like in my case, saying the migrant struggle or in my community, the black and brown struggle. Um, those are those are some of the lessons that I take away from my experience in in Chiapas and Palestine. And, and one final, final thing, because uh, I think it's so key, a huge lesson I think Palestine has for us is, you know, both Palestine and the Zapatistas are very centered on dignity. I see it everywhere. You see it, you feel it, they feel it, they teach us. And what Palestine has taught me is the importance of any movement that we create is that we do not become the monsters that we're struggling against, which sadly is what the Jewish liberation movement moves towards in choosing Zionism as it's one of its many options. That's the one that it chose is to be together with empire. And so how do we not replicate that? And the Zapatistas, uh, what, they, what they, the inspiration that they bring to me and to I think many people is we're gonna experiment with something else. This, the question of domination is so key with them. They, and, and they don't see it in this dominant world. They don't see a possibility for a politics without domination. And so they say, maybe we just need to go create another world where many worlds fit. And I'll leave it at that for now.
Thank you. That that was really, really interesting. I, I think I have about a million and two questions for you I'm on the back of that. Um, but I'm going to hold off on my questions, uh, reluctant as I am, because we need to have time for our third speaker today. So our third speaker will be, so I'm just getting my notes up here, will be Vianne um, Kikrox. Vianne spent a year as an internationalist volunteer in Rojava, West Kurdistan, working with the revolutionary movement for women's liberation, ecology, and radical democracy. She will be talking about her experience working within the movement and the solidarity work she is involved in within the UK, which seeks to not only support Kurdistan, but also bring the principles and analysis of the Kurdish freedom movement to political activism here in the UK. Thanks, Anthony, um, and thank you for having me. Um, so as Anthony introduced me, um, I go by Vian. I also go by Natalia. Um, and I was asked to speak because I spent a year in Rojava in Northeast Syria, also known as West Kurdistan. And um, when you join the struggle, when you kind of as an internationalist volunteer in Rojava in Kurdistan, um, the movement asks you to take a Kurdish name um, in order to honor those who have come before. So that's why I go by Vian, which is a Kurdin, Kurdish name named after um, a woman who died in the struggle um, in the 90s um, or in the early noughties. Um, so that's why I go by two names. Um, and it for me is a, is a way to honor the sort of friendship and comradeship and um, lessons that I learned the sort of transformation I was like, yeah, enabled to, um, to undergo through my time working with the movement and which is ongoing um, through my time working with the Kurdistan Freedom Movement in the UK as well. Um, so I'm really tempted to like immediately launch into conversation with the previous speakers. And thank you so much for all those perspectives because like my brain is absolutely buzzing. Um, I'm going to try to take a few steps back because I'm aware that a lot of people probably don't actually know a lot about Kurdistan or the Rojava revolution. Um, so I'm going to try to assume no knowledge and just give a bit of like a rough sketch um, so we're all on the same page. But before I kind of launch into like PowerPoint presentation mode, um, maybe if people like can type in the chat box, like what do you know about Rojava? What do you know about the Kurdistan freedom movement? Like what words come to mind when you hear Rojava revolution, just so we can kind of get a sense of like what's in the room um, and what kind of like yeah, experience and knowledge that people are bringing in um, before I kind of go into nothing that is absolutely fine. We're all here to learn. Um, women militias, yeah, there are a lot of women fighters. There's autonomous women's forces on several levels um, in the Kurdistan freedom movement, women's power. Yeah, it's definitely, um, some people call it a feminist revolution. Of course, there's discussions about, you know, who gets to define what feminism is, um, but certainly women's liberation is one of the central pillars of the Kurdistan freedom movement. Um, yeah, Abdullah Ocalan is the one of the main political theorists behind the movement um, who has written a lot about the ideology, who's been in a solitary confinement, confined on a Turkish island, um, held captive by the Turkish state for the past 21 years now. Um, so there's a lot of kind of, yeah, green e ecology, perpetual revolution, yep, ongoing struggle. So there's lots of, there's a lot of knowledge in the room, but let's take a second to zoom out um, and try to give a bit of a snapshot of what, um, yeah, 21 years in solitary confinement on an island. Um, so what is Rojava? So the very rough sketch, just give me two seconds to uh, share my screen, which is something I'm terrible at doing, even though I do it all the time. Here we are. Can you guys see that okay? Great, thank you. All right, so this is just a quick map um, of Kurdistan. So Kurdistan isn't a state. It literally translates into the place of the Kurds. So it's a region that's split across Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. So that kind of red outline is where Kurdistan is, where Kurdish people have historically lived. Um, but because of the intervention of imperialist powers, including Great Britain, um, Kurdistan was cut up and most of the people then became minorities within often quite authoritarian states. Um, so Rojava also translates into West, so it's West Kurdistan, and it's that red strip just at the top of Syria. So that's the kind of Kurdish majority region, which is called Rojava. 
And just to note that actually now the Rojava revolution and the governance system set up by the movement there over the past uh, nine years actually extends a bit beyond that. Um, so it's not just that strip, um, but the area that is currently undergoing this revolutionary process, um, which centers women's liberation, ecology, and grassroots democracy um, is about twice the size of Wales. So um, it's about 50,000 um, square kilometers. So if you think of like the south of England, it's essentially the size of the south of England, kind of up towards sort of like Birmingham. So it's quite a sizable chunk. It's um, three to four million people live there. So it's not, it's not a tiny region. I kind of emphasize that because I think a lot of people think it's a really tiny, tiny space, but actually um, it's, it's quite significant. Um, so most people have come across Rojava um, from various significant moments in the fight against Islamic State, the ISIS Caliphate, and it was the um, Kurdish uh, military forces which then defeated um, the Islamic State and kind of in the very monu monumental like Battle of Kobani, turned the tide, and just in March 2019 actually finally eliminated the um, physical presence of the Islamic State Caliphate. So that's a really famous picture of one of the women fighters of the women's defense units um, taking down an ISIS flag, which symbolizes you know, patriarchy and violence and um, fascism, and instead putting up the Yepige flag, which signifies women's liberation and democracy and ecology and self-defense. So that's a really beautiful moment, um, which kind of yeah resonated around the world. Um, and in that battle, there were a lot of people have fallen, about 12,000 people have died in the struggle um, against Islamic State and other forms of fascism, um, like the Turkish state. So it's quite a, it's a huge, huge um, revolutionary process that has touched pretty much every single person who lives in that region. So there's actually a lot of really strong commitment to the ideals of the revolution because so many people have fallen in the struggle. And it's a really beautiful thing to actually see their memory kept alive um, through that struggle. Um, so we're talking about Rojava and the Rojava revolution, because that's actually the place where the Kurdistan freedom movement holds territory. But it's really important to remember that it's not just Northeast Syria, that actually the Kurdistan freedom movement is a movement that, that spans across Kurdistan and in fact across you know, Europe and the rest of the world, mostly through Kurdish diaspora communities. Um, but it holds like it has a clear yeah, ideological understanding, which maybe speaks a little bit to what Kiki was saying around like there is a clear um, ideology and political framework that it operates in. So the Kurdistan freedom movement exists wherever that political framework is being brought into life um, by people, whether they're Kurdish or not, like myself. Um, so it's part of that wider movement. There's been huge like democratic confederalist um, movements in um, Southeast Turkey, in Northern Kurdistan, as well as across um, Kurdistan. And it's an ongoing struggle. It's not something that just um, popped up um, in 2012. Um, which is when the territory became semi-autonomous after the aftermath of the Arab Spring. Um, but it actually has its roots in the guerrilla struggle against the Turkish state for the past sort of like 50 years. Um, and in fact, um, it's been an internationalist movement from the beginning, um, welcoming in volunteers from Turkey, from across Kurdistan and the Middle East. Um, and in fact, some of the earliest um, revolutionaries with the Kurdistan freedom movement were training with the PFLP um, decades ago. So those links have actually existed for a long time. And those links with the Zapatista struggle have also existed. If you look at some of the earliest writings um, of the Zapatista movement, references to Kurdistan and the struggle of the Kurdish people have been there from the beginning. So I feel like these movements are so much in conversation with each other. And it's really amazing that we're, you know, we're here decades later, still in conversation with each other um, and talking about how we yeah, situate ourselves um, in solidarity with accompanying and as part of these movements as well. Um, so there's a lot of resonance both in the history, but also in the politics with Zapatista struggles in terms of being anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist and really trying to find a way to, um, yeah, confront domination and create a world where there is no more domination in some way. And it's quite difficult to know, you know, where it's a start, because I could go back, you know, decades and give you a, you know, blow by blow account of how this movement grew from a handful of people in southeastern Turkey to a powerful movement encompassing millions of people that actually holds a huge territory in North and East Syria. But we're not going to go into all the history. I feel like we're now kind of roughly up to speed um, with history. And I'm going to start instead um, a few years ago um, when this part of the world, which actually, you know, at that time meant nothing to me, became suddenly very important in my life, which was um, in 2018, in March, um, I had been involved in like 
climate struggles and feminist struggles, anti-fascist struggles in the UK for quite a long time. But the Kurdistan Freedom Movement and Rojava didn't really register um, until a good friend of mine, Anna Campbell, went to Rojava as a volunteer, um, as an anti-fascist, as a feminist. And she went to volunteer with the women's defense units um, in order to fight Islamic State. Um, and yeah, that's her on the left. And sadly, in 2018, she was killed by a Turkish airstrike when Turkey was invading northeast Syria. So her death obviously had like a really big impact on me. Um, and after kind of like a few months of like finding out more about the struggle, trying to understand like why it meant so much to her that she was willing to give her life for it. Um, I just kind of felt that, hey, I actually need to go as well and like follow in her footsteps and, and finish that journey that she started. Um, so I ended up going with an ecological project that's me on the right, contemplating a tree very seriously. Um, and I went there um, as someone who's yeah, into ecological movements and who's a food grower um, in the UK in order to yeah help and join the movement in some way. Um, and I think something that probably resonates quite a lot with what has been said already today is that um, a lot of internationalist volunteers uh, maybe go somewhere to help. And then you quickly find out like, um, I'm not really helping. I'm 100% learning. Um, and something that I really valued about the Kurdish freedom movement is that they're just really explicit about that kind of how like Tash mentioned, they were like, look at your social movements back in Europe. They're absolute crap. What are you guys thinking? Like you're here to learn from us about how to build like a powerful revolutionary social movement. And we welcome you to join us as comrades, you know, side by side on that journey. But actually a lot of the time I was in Rojava, I was, um, I was learning, I was in workshops and seminars. I was, um, you know, being, you know, sent to sit in the kitchen, you know, on the floor around, you know, the kitchen or the living room or the bedrooms or the gardens of families from society to ask them like, what's, uh, what's, what's your struggle? You know, what does it look like? Um, so that was a really important kind of experience for me to do that learning um, while I was there um, and to be very humbled on the one hand, but also like really empowered because again, what's been said um, already before is that the biggest ask of that revolution of the comrades in Kurdistan is go home and organize there. You know, we cannot have Rojava here if we don't also have a revolutionary social movement in the UK, in Europe, in America, wherever you come from across the Middle East. Um, so you kind of arrive, you get kind of taken down quite a few notches and then you get slowly built back up again, sort of as a revolutionary, as someone who is actually invited, empowered and, and really requested um, to go and yeah, build Rojava wherever you are, wherever you end up. Um, so just to kind of give the, the snapshot of what, um, what the movement, what the revolution, revolution movement is premised on, it's women's liberation, ecology, and radical democracy. So these are the three pillars. Um, so I think these are things that we can all like resonate with quite a lot. And, you know, we have lots of people like involved in like ecological gardening projects, um, a lot of people setting up ecological cooperatives, um, a devolution of democratic power to localities who then federate upwards. Um, and you have a huge empowerment of women um, on a sort of tangible level, on a sort of military self-defense level, but also on an ideological and organizational level, like women are really seen as the forefront of the revolution in a very, in a very, very serious way um, in that, um, every single institution, every single leadership position is co-held um, by a man and a woman. You know, there's, there's never going to be a man who's in power on his own. And then every institution then has an autonomous parallel women's institution who will then have usually two women who are in charge, like who are kind of coordinators or project managers or delegates, um, kind of however that works out. So then you kind of get into a situation where if you have a mixed gender structure, and an autonomous women's structure, and you don't have a men's structure, um, and each of these kind of, whether it's a co-op or a union or an academy or an assembly, they each have these double leadership positions. You actually have about 75% of the leadership positions across society, across the economy, across the political sphere held by women. So it's a real material like transferal of power from, from yeah, the men representing you know, a patriarchal approach to organizing to, to the women's movement. Um, so that's something that's really impressive. Um, and then that's, um, oh, and also by the way, I actually can't see the chat box. So if there's any kind of like questions or like, please slow down, you talk too fast. I know I talk too fast, I'm sorry. Um, please just unmute yourself and let me know because I won't be able to see you. Um, grand, 
so there's also this recognition of this like interconnection between these three pillars that women's liberation isn't separate from ecology isn't separate from democracy so here we have um solar panels on the roof of the um, buildings of the women's village which runs on a democratic ecological cooperative basis um so they're all kind of intertwined um and yeah, this is a women's education at the same kind of women's village um and i'm just kind of i, I wanted to show some pictures because again like for something that it comes from a movement from a part of the world that so few of us actually know a lot about it, it can be nice to see things just so you can start to imagine them and that's something that i know i really struggled with when i was um exchanging emails with anna before she was killed when she was over there i just had no way of like imagining like what's your life like what does it look like you know how do you eat where do you sleep so this is just to kind of bring it to life a little bit more um because you know i think that radical imagination is really important if we're thinking about well how do we build a, a revolutionary approach to politics here um so these are just some more kind of snapshots of again the women's village using traditional ecological building techniques um celebration is a really important part of building a revolutionary culture because you know as humans like our political selves aren't separate from that part of ourselves that needs to dance that needs to build community that needs to build friendship um so a lot of the time um in rojava we we spend dancing and learning the very complicated steps to a lot of the traditional kurdish dances um and yeah older women mothers and young women are really seen as yeah, the forefront of the revolution and given a lot of reverence. Um, that's not to say at all that there aren't struggles against patriarchy within the movement, within society, um, but there is that, um, that determination. For example, every single protest march is led by women. And you'll have these older women, the, the grandmothers at the front leading, leading the marches. Um, and you'll have the older women um, who are the volunteer community defense forces who literally yeah, patrol the neighborhood with AK-47s in order to kind of protect their community against any external threat or to intervene in cases of kind of domestic conflict or anything like that. So um, there's been like just huge steps made on so many different fronts. I'm gonna try to maybe speed up a tiny bit because I'm running behind time a little bit, but yeah, ecological economy, the, the definition of the movement is that um, if you look at the sort of a uh, root definition of what economy is, it means the management of the household. So they've gone, okay, well, actually, let's think about what capitalism does. Does capitalism enable us to manage our household and meet our needs? Um, no, it doesn't. So capitalism actually isn't an economy. It's an anti-economy. Let's come up with a definition of economy that does um, meet the needs of our home, which is both our communities and our households, but also the natural world. So that kind of ecological approach is completely intertwined with what economy means. And obviously they have the same root, right? ECO, eco, oikos, it comes from home or household. Um, so really recognizing ourselves as being located within the natural world and part of the natural world. So it's not just a question of how many trees did you plant or do you use pesticides in your garden? It's really just like, do you fundamentally see yourself as part of nature? And are you willing, are you able to take this holistic approach to your political organizing and ecological approach where you see how things are connected? where you don't try to falsely break things down into categories when actually they're all interconnected. Um, so this is just lots of pictures of, yeah, cooperative bakeries, cooperative tree projects. And this is across both Northeast Syria and Rojava, but also in Southeast Syria, in Turkey, in Bakur, in Northern Kurdistan. Because um, as I said, the movements yet yeah, are, are more or less one and the same. I mean, they come from the same spirit. Um, so in the, if we think we're hot in this heat, I mean, it's a lot hotter there and yet, it's a very fertile, beautiful space um, and radical grassroots democracy. So again, this devolution of power to communities, the de democratization of every aspect of our lives from politics and governance to economy to self-defense, like there's an effort to really democratize as much as possible, but also organize, right? Localized and devolved doesn't mean disconnected, doesn't mean that communities are independent from each other, very much seeing everything as interdependent, as interconnected and as like militant organization as being the glue that holds things together. Um, so I'm gonna, and this is just a lovely um, poster. That's just, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? Which is something that we say all the time. And it's nice to see that mirrored um, there as well. Um, oh, and this is uh, just a final photo of uh, Leila Khaled and Leila Guven, who was a Kurdish politician who was on hunger strike at this point for 
159 days. Um, so Leila Khaled visited her when she was on hunger strike in order to show solidarity and um, build a bridge between the struggles. Um, so that's a bit of a kind of like whirlwind tour of, you know, Rojava, Kurdistan freedom movement. I mean, you can read like books about it. And, you know, I was there for a year and have only brushed the surface of kind of what it means um, to, yeah, to be part of the Kurdistan freedom movement. But I do still see myself as very much part of it because I was invited into it. Um, I was asked, you know, walk alongside us in the struggle um, and wherever you are from, wherever you go back, um, build that struggle there. Um, and so that's part of our task, right, as revolutionaries is to build up a Rojava or a Chiapas or some kind of revolutionary approach to politics um, wherever we are um, and to connect those struggles like through organization, through solidarity, to see ourselves as accountable if there aren't actual sort of movement organizational structures where we are, we're accountable to the ideology, we're accountable to the values of what it means to fight for a world um, without domination, to a fight for a world which centers um, liberation and democracy and dignity. Um, so there's a lot um, to say there about, yeah, solidarity and kind of what it means to have unconditional solidarity with these movements who give us, um, yeah, the faith and the hope um, that we need in order to like apply ourselves to the struggles back home. Um, but yeah, I think one thing we can do is learn and listen and ask the right questions. So I guess I'll leave you with a question that's often asked um, in Rojava during um, educations, during kind of these seminars and workshops that internationalists participate in, which is um, what kind of world do we want to live in? How do we get there? And where do we start? And I hope that that's one of the questions that we can ask ourselves um, in this seminar and all of our work following. ganancias no las vemos jamás nuestros hijos son carne de vecindad expuestos a toda la calamidad mientras la familia del patrón se va cada vez que quiere a vacacionar nuestros hijos juegan entre los dasal cual condenados a perpetuidad Nosotros generamos producción, que es la base de toda felicidad, porque no tenemos oportunidad de obtener tan solo una buena ración. Nos dicen que es por el bien de la nación, que la patria exige amor y abnegación. Habría que saber que entienden por amor y desde luego por abnegación. acostumbrado está que es un sinvergüenza le puedes gritar como ya lo sabe no le importará puedes insultarlo y solo se reirá pues tiene una concha como de caimán si emplazas a huelga entonces si sí verás cómo es posible oírlo rebuznar de colores como el camaleón según lo que trame y según la ocasión frente al poderoso parece ratón pero ante los débiles es un león es blanca paloma con piel de reptil cuando le conviene ser ruin y servil a los animales les pido perdón por haber hecho esta comparación Ciego lo dejó, ni siquiera un médico de guardia yo. Y 
Si el patrón lo echó cuando no le sirvió Más de 25 años de trabajar No le dieron siquiera indemnización Historias como estas se repetirán Si no tenemos organización Si las máquinas podemos engrasar Tuercas y tornillos sabemos armar hasta el torno nos parece familiar y usamos aceites con facilidad. Vamos aceitando los engranes ya de nuestra conciencia que dormida está. Que la producción produzca bienestar para el obrero que vida le da. Que la producción produzca bienestar para el obrero. 